Welcome everyone, you are listening to the new Votes and Seeds podcast episode of the Center for Political Science of Matthias Korbinos Collegium. My name is Sabo Janik, Senior Researcher of the Center. A number of local and national legislative elections were held along the European Parliament elections a couple of weeks ago. In today's episode, we will discuss one of such elections, namely the Belgian federal election. And I have the honor to welcome Bjorn Eck, PhD researcher at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Mr. Eck, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. You know, Belgium is a special federal state uh, characterized by a complex division of uh, legislative and executive powers between uh, different community, regional and federal levels. Could you, pre- as a starting point, could you please briefly explain the general political significance of the federal elections uh, in Belgium in general, generally speaking? Yes, of course. Uh, I think to do that, it would be good to take a step back and have a bit of a look at how Belgium is organized. Um, because actually at the 9th of June, the Sunday, uh, there were no less than seven elections in Belgium. And that has all to do with how the, the state is organized. So I won't dive into all of these elections because some are a bit less uh, interesting uh, to, to listeners than, than the others. Uh, I would say that generally speaking, the, the, the biggest attention goes to the three regional elections and the federal elections. So this has to do with how the country is structured. Um, generally speaking, there are three regions. The northern part of Flanders, which uh, consists of mostly Dutch-speaking uh, people. The southern part of Wallonia, which mostly consists of people who speak French. And then there's the capital region of Brussels, which consi- consists of both French-speaking and Dutch-speaking people, uh, mostly French-speaking. But there is uh, definitely a sizable Dutch minority, which also finds its, their, uh, its own representation in that parliament. So to go back to the elections, um, there were three regional elections uh, in Wallonia, in Flanders and in Brussels. And then there was also a federal election on the same day, which goes for the federal parliament, which uh, basically unites the whole country and represents the whole country in that sense. Um, the interesting thing about Belgium is that these three regions at the federal level are all represented by their own language parties. So to say, if I am a Flemish voter and I can only vote for Flemish parties, um, and these Flemish parties only compete in the northern part of Flanders. In a similar way, if I'm a Walloon voter, French speaker, then I can only vote for Walloon parties. And these parties generally also only compete in the Walloon region. There is one exception, the radical left, PTB uh, PVNA. This is a party which actually competes in uh, the whole region. In all regions, I mean, and uh, as such, also finds uh, federal uh, representation throughout the whole country. What you do see is that the different parties, they do collaborate among party families. So, for example, you have the liberals in both Flanders and Wallonia. There are the Christian Democrats in both regions, and you have the socialists in both regions. And although this is not carved into stone, um, I would say that mostly those parties also enter the federal government together. They don't always do it. There are definitely exceptions, but they do try to do it. Um, And what is interesting about the federal level, so the federal government, which um, unites the whole country, is that, first of all, it delivers the prime prime minister. But other than that, it also um, has the say about the highest competences, so to say. So they decide about finances, justice, social security, foreign affairs, and the army and also important aspects of uh, the healthcare system. The regional parliaments, so the ones of Wallonia, Brussels, and Flanders, they also have their own competences, and these competences have actually increased over the years. The the regions have become more autonomous over uh, decades of state reforms, but they have a say about competences that are, so to say, on a lower level. Um, and interestingly, the, the governments at the federal level, they, they need to consist of both parties, uh, of Dutch-speaking parties and French-speaking parties. Um, actually, the ministers should consist of an equal number of Dutch and French-speaking people. Uh, the elections are held once in five years. So, yeah, uh, the federal federal level elections, um, are, they, do, they do not uh, occur uh, very often. Also because you could say that the, the coalitions, they generally do not fall early. And if you are a bit familiar with Belgium, then you might also know that the coalition formation uh, takes quite long. And these stories that you know about the long coalition formations, they are mostly at the federal level. So this is because here, Walloon and uh, Flemish parties really have to cooperate together in a coalition. 
And this is uh, where this has sometimes taken years. And these coalitions, since it already takes so long for them to, to be formed, they are generally, uh, they sit out the ride until the end. And if not, they continue as a caretaker government until the next elections. So these elections really usually only take place once in five years. Thank you, Navi. I think now, and personally, uh, I, I do uh, have, a, have a better understanding of, of how, how this these uh, federal elections uh, work out there in, in Belgium. And, and now turning to the subject of this podcast episode, uh, this, uh, this this most recent uh, uh, federal election, what was the most surprising part of the of the result uh, for you personally? And uh, if you had to name the, the winners and losers of this election, of course, nationwide, uh, who, who would they be in, in your opinion? Yeah, looking at the federal elections, uh, I do have to divide again between uh, Flanders and Wallonia. Also, if I look at the surprising elements, because if I look at Flanders, the one of the main topics also during the campaign was how well the populist radical right party Flams Belang, uh, uh, short name VB, would do during the elections, because it was projected to actually win the election and it might actually surpass uh, 30% of the votes, which would be huge. In the end, uh, and it was followed by the NVA, which is the Nationalist Flemish Party, uh, center-right party, nationalist elements in the sense that they want to have a more autonomous Flanders, uh, and in the end actually is a, a separated Flanders. Uh, and this was the largest party thus far. The question was a bit who was going to become the biggest. And there were a lot of projections saying that the radical right, uh, Frans Vlang, would actually become the biggest and also um, with quite uh, a decisible difference uh, with uh, the NVA. In the end, that did not happen. So I would say the, the biggest surprise at the, the Flemish side was that the NVA in the end actually won the elections. They, they lost some seats, but they did become the biggest party in terms of seat share. And the Vlaams Wallon, while they did win the election, because they definitely increased their seat share, they became second. And as such, yeah, it was a bit of a of a double-edged sword. So they definitely did well, but you could notice also on election night that they were quite disappointed with the result because they had expected maybe to do better because the projections also in the polls before the elections definitely said that Flans uh a lot of times said that Flans Wallang would become the biggest party. So for them to become in the end second was maybe a bit disappointing, but on the other hand, they did perform very well. Uh, then turning to Wallonia, uh, there was a huge shift. Uh, Wallonia has traditionally been governed by the Socialist Party PS. And the PS actually lost quite heavily. Uh, and the biggest surprise there was that uh, the, uh, the Liberals, the MR, which is the central right liberal party, they uh, they won quite sizably in seat shares. And they also became the largest party, something that uh, hasn't happened in a very long time or even ever, I would say. Um, and as such, that was the, uh, the big shift in Wallonia. There was definitely a shift to the right. Um, and uh, I would say that's the most surprising element. In terms of winners and losers, so yeah, I, I named it already a bit. What you could add to that is that, interestingly, the parties that were part of the uh, incumbent Vivaldi government, as it's named, uh, all parties except for the Dutch socialists actually lost uh, votes and seats as such. So they all, they all, took quite a blow, some more than others. Some remained rather stable, but for example, um, there is another exception, sorry, which is the, the MR, the, the, the French liberals, which I already named, they were also part of Vivaldi. So Vivaldi and the Dutch socialists, they both gained seat share, but all the other government parties at the federal level, they either lost or lost a little bit, remained stable, so to say. Um, so you could say that the, the, the current uh, government, the Vivaldi government parties, did not do well. And especially the party that delivered the prime minister, Alexander de Croo, which is from the Dutch-speaking uh, Open VLD, the Dutch liberals, they they really, really lost a lot of seats. Uh, they took a huge blow. And also the Green parties on both sides of the, the, the language divide uh, did very poorly. They both lost uh, quite severely in uh, in both regions. Uh, and as such, uh, yeah, became much more parties after the elections. And in your in your opinion, what what could what could be the the, the true true political stake of of this this election, in particular for the voters? So so uh, all it was all all about uh, uh, the classical uh, punishment of of the incumbents or 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 voting for something as maybe policy. It was a, it was a. a 
race of policy alternatives uh, on on key issues how how do you see how could the voters uh, either either in in flanders or or wallonia interpret or perceive this election yeah i think there were a couple of issues that really played a, a big role also during the campaign uh, the first one was whether the cordon sanitaire would be broken which i need to explain a bit um in flanders as i already mentioned there exists a populist radical right party france Wallon. Um, when its predecessor came into uh, into parliament in 1991, uh, all the other parties uh, signed an agreement, the Cordon Sanitaire, to never govern with this party because of its uh, extremist views, its radical right party. Uh, they decided that they didn't want, did not want to normalize that. Um, but now that it had become so big in the in the polls, at least during the run up to the elections, uh, there was a question whether the NVA, the, the nationalist uh, right wing party, would actually break the Cordon Sanitaire. In fact, the NVA was um, founded after the signing of the Cordon Sanitaire, so it never really signed the agreement. And it had been quite ambiguous about whether it would or not uh, govern with France Belong after the elections. Um, and then there was an important campaign moment when its leader of, of the NVA, Bart de Wever, uh, at some point said, I will not govern with France Belong. And I think this was a key issue, issue during the campaign because it really showed that Bart de Wever wanted to become part of a next center-right uh, government, especially at the federal level, with himself as prime minister. Uh, and he also, in that way, kind of showed that, at least that's what he tried to do, he wanted to show that he was the reasonable alternative to Flans Belang. If you have uh, ambitions for a more autonomous Flanders, uh, and he also really focused on other topics than Flans Belang in terms of focusing really on economic issues as well, state finances, then he was the reasonable alternative. That's at least how we tried to present himself. So this was a huge topic during the campaign. Other than that, I think the economy played quite a, big, a bit of a role. Um, Belton has created rather large deficits in the past years. And during the campaign, it was already quite obvious that the European Commission would uh, come with a plan for a structural reform uh, relatively soon because it was surpassing the 3% uh, deficit uh, norm. So this, this was a, a big campaign topic. Like there are a lot of things that need to be tackled in the country, but one of the topics was also we cannot do everything because we uh, have to take care of our government finances. And this is really something that the NVA stressed a lot. Also to show to voters, we are a reasonable alternative to Vlaams Belang because you know we take care of the budget. We really uh, try to have a stable government with stable finances, and we have to make some, uh, some budgetary cuts uh, for sure after the elections. And then I would say, um, it was also rather striking that several governing parties, especially the ones that took a huge blow. So, for example, I was mentioning the Green parties, but also the party of uh, incumbent um, Prime Minister Alexander de Co. Open PLD. They were not really able to profile themselves. It was not really clear what they stood for. I mean, the Green parties, um, I guess it's not so uh, ambiguous what they stand for, but I guess they were suffering from the fact that climate issues were not really a big campaign topic. So in that sense, they could not really profile themselves. And Alexander de Croo was still leading the party also during the campaign. Um, well, I guess um, his, his main campaign movement in the end was saying that he it was would not be good for his health if he would continue with the current government after the elections. So I'm not sure if that's a great selling point uh, for your own party if you have been leading it for several years. Uh, so I guess these are the main things. And then what you would see in Wallonia was also interesting that uh, the MR who who won the elections there, they really moved to the right economically, mostly. So they were really saying that more Walloons should get to work, that they should take care of more of their finances. Um, and they were, in that sense, also really bashing the, the PS, which has been governing there for decades. But interestingly, it has also been a coalition party of the MR in both the regional and the federal government. Um, so this was quite a big clash. And the PS felt that they should move a bit to the left because on their left, they actually had the radical left, PTB, um, which was also attacking them. So what you saw, saw was that the PS was moving to the left, MR was moving to the right, and then there was some space created in the center, which was uh, profited from, from uh, Les Engagés, which is a Christian Democratic Party. And they were also one of the winners of the elections in, the, in the Wallonia. They definitely won uh, quite a lot of seats. You also touched up on the the campaign issues or or how how the how the players to, uh, try to thematize the agenda. Uh, Jen, I, I have a more general question uh, in this regard. So, how how should we uh, imagine 
these these uh, parallel elections in in terms of campaigning. So, uh, are 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 these party campaigns uh, uh, designed in in light of this fragmented political landscape? Do regional and federal campaign strategies, uh, topics, messages differ at all, or or how? But, what what are these parties doing practically when you have say seven seven different uh, kind of elections of course you, you cannot communicate uh, completely different things uh, in a campaign if if you are a, a political player but still how do you how do you uh, resolve this this uh, situation yeah it's an interesting question indeed i think that definitely the regional and the federal level they 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 really uh, dominate in the campaigns also, because even though at the regional, at the federal, and the federal, there are different competences, they also speak to each other. So it's not like you have to really um, uh, perform a totally different campaign on the regional than on the federal level. And though there is some split ticket voting, mostly uh, most voters also vote for the same parties regionally and federally. So in that sense, you can bear more or less um, follow the same campaign. But it also becomes more tricky because some parties have been part of the federal government, but not the regional one, or vice versa. So for voters, it might also sometimes be difficult to punish or reward parties, even though there are different competences. It's not like they are always entirely different, and maybe you care about one issue, but not the other. So in that sense, uh, it is indeed a very unique case. And also in a sense that um, yeah, you really see two different campaigns along the language regions who barely align and barely speak to each other, in my opinion. Um, this has also to do with the media environment, which is really focused on the own language group and the own language parties. Um, in the end, there was actually a debate between uh, NVA leader Bart de Rever and uh, PS of, of Wallonia, uh, PS leader Paul Magnet, uh, because in the end, parties across both regions, they have to form a government, right? So you would expect that uh, they reach out to each other or that they at least indeed debate with each other because they also, after the elections, have to have to form a coalition and negotiate. Um, but in my opinion, this doesn't happen so much. And you also, yeah, you really see a, a different political landscape where in, in, in Flanders, uh, it's typically seen as, as, a, as a region that votes rather right wing, which also indeed has a classical populist radical right party, which has existed for decades and which, uh, in a sense, can be compared to the, the other ones that we know in Europe. Well, in Wallonia, it's, it's much more uh, left leaning and also left voting. Like the last election was quite a bit deviating, as I mentioned, because the MR, which is a liberal right-wing party, uh, winning a lot of votes. But for example, it doesn't have a populist radical right-wing party. And it also has to do with the fact that not only is there a cordon sanitaire in Wallonia as well, also those parties refuse to have any cooperation with France Belang. Um, there's also a, a cordon mediatique, so, which means that the media actually do not give any attention to these kinds of parties, even if they emerge. They do not give them any attention, any screen time. Uh, and that has been argued by, by some scholars to be one of the core reasons why there is no populist radical right party in uh, in Wallonia. So, yeah, you, I would say you definitely see two campaigns across the language regions. And then on the different levels, regional and federal, I think they, they, they align quite well. I must say for the European elections, there's not so much attention, I would rather say. Uh, I haven't seen that much. It's, it's mostly focused on the national and regional issues, for sure. You, you already mentioned uh, the state of the economy, unemployment, uh, public finances as, as a as a key uh, topic of of this uh, this uh, 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 federal action campaign. What other key issues uh, were on the agenda? And I'm asking this because uh, if you look at the overall uh, European Parliament election landscape or level. We see that uh, seemingly the Greens and Liberals were kind of punished or, or at least uh, faced uh, uh, a severe setback in terms of their vote share, uh, seat share. And maybe this could be associated with the European Green Deal as for, as for the Greens, while maybe the Liberals, uh, in part, in, namely the Renew, Renew Europe, uh, maybe for its... Uh, uh, more interventionist uh, uh, communication and harder politi uh, harder uh, stance on the war in Ukraine. Uh, if if you agree or, or somehow can embrace this uh, explana possible explanation, uh, did it did it work out also in Belgium or did you see any signs of it? Were these at all topics in the campaign or did, did they appear on the agenda of the parties? 
Yeah, so interestingly, I would say that climate issues and indeed the war in Ukraine, they were quite absent in the in the campaign. Um, the, it also stru uh, struck me quite a bit that the climate issues were, were not part of it because I think it was quite different a couple of years ago. Um, I find it quite difficult to pinpoint why this is the case. Maybe it has been, um, yeah, other topics have simply taken over. It could also be that there have take, been taken some considerable steps in terms of, of climate uh, climate policies, and that this issue is less polarizing than it was a couple of years ago. That I could also imagine. Uh, so in that sense, it's more difficult to really profile there. What we've also seen in, for example, um, the Dutch elections in November, I would also say that the climate policies were not so much present, uh, debates about climate uh, climate policies. But the, the government, which uh, was announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, also with uh, a document presenting their policies. It didn't really, even though it consists of quite a, a right-wing, uh, uh, a set of right-wing parties and even a radical right-wing party, it didn't really turn back a lot of climate policies that much. There are some some aspects on nitrogen, but generally speaking, the line, the, 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 the policy path that has been taken a couple of years ago is continued. So maybe this is part of the explanation, but I find it quite a bit difficult to, to really pinpoint this. Regarding the war in Ukraine, yeah, as well, quite absent, but I think that also has to do with the fact that this is not a very polarizing issues uh, issue for the simple reason that most parties really agree that they should be supporting Ukraine. Um, in relation to that, you do you did see some more um, discussion about military spending. Belgium is actually one of the countries with the lowest uh, military spending within NATO, and there is common agreement, I would say, on uh, raising this. Uh, increasing the, the the share of military spending, but there's not so much agreement yet on uh, where to get these finances because, as I said, actually some budgetary cuts have to be made, and a lot of parties included it in their program, but they didn't really make a calculation on how to finance this. There's one big exception, uh, and that's the radical left PTB PVNA, which is really calling for a peace deal. It's also uh, a peace deal in Ukraine. Um, which really wants to negotiate with Russia uh, on, on a peace deal and really wants to stop military military um, assistance to Ukraine, simply because they say they claim that it's costing too many lives. It doesn't really it doesn't really specify on how this peace deal should uh, should work out. Uh, it also doesn't really specify on how uh, this would take into account uh, Ukraine, Ukraine autonomy, for example. So um, this is the only party that really takes a different stand there. Um, it's also a party that's really anti-NATO, and even in their ca in their um, campaign documents, they really claim to that they want to leave NATO, which really comes from a, an anti-American viewpoint as well. So it's really, really a, a radical left party in a way that we see less and less in Europe, um, especially because they are one of the, the the parties that did quite well in the elections. They were one of the winners, um, and, but it's also a party that other parties they don't really want to to collaborate with. Um, there's no, no cordon sanitaire as it, there is towards France Boulogne, but in general, it's excluded from, from government formations and it's not really considered as a viable option either. But yeah, so concerning Ukraine, it, it's, it's one of the few parties that polarizes over this issue, um, but the other parties simply agree that they want to continue um, support for, for, for Ukraine and also that they want to increase military spending. We haven't talked about uh, the issue of migration, which is which is a, a, a hot topic uh, in many respects still today because it's, it's uh, I think it's a, it's a suitable for for creating even a cleavage or at least at least could align in in other other cleavages anti-immigration rhetoric and and harder uh, stances of uh, migration did it did it appear in the campaign in any form by by any uh, political party yes I would say this is mostly an issue that appears in Flanders. Also, again, because of the presence of the populist radical right there. But I think that in the end, the Flaus Belong um, leadership is a bit disappointed with indeed that it has not been such a big campaign topic as they might have expected it to be. Um, I think this was one of the strategic movements of, of uh, NVA leader Bart de Wever to really focus more on the economy. Maybe also learning from the Dutch case a couple of months back where you could really see if you make a campaign totally about migration, then people will vote for a party that has a firm stance on migration. They will vote for the original, not the copy. 
So I think part of in that sense learned from the Dutch case and also really made sure to to shift the, the campaign a bit towards more economic issues. It has definitely been part of it. It's also not like part of it completely ignored the issue. Um, migration was definitely part of the campaign. Um, and you could also see that, for example, the Dutch socialists, uh, right, that they also moved quite a bit to the right on this issue and has have as such also become maybe a bit more feasible to become part of the of the governments uh, now after the elections. So that was, I would say, there's definitely a tough stand on migration, and this has also been in relation to maybe some more integration issues that you see uh, in Belgium. But um, I think in the end that the party that gains the most from this topic being the main campaign issue uh, might be a bit disappointed that it has not been so much about migration in the end. And I think the last uh, uh, question or, or subtopic that uh, we should address uh, in, in this podcast is the the, the chances for a new government, you you mentioned that uh, Decro announced his resignation right after the, the heavy defeat in the European regional and uh, federal elections. Does this matter in any way in the process of forming a new government? And uh, for the time being, what is the most likely coalition uh, that that might sa- be set up uh, in the in the near future? Yeah, no, I think this is actually mostly symbolic that he resigned, uh, which simply means that uh, his government will continue as a caretaker government. It's also not like he really stepped down as a prime minister. He will be part of that caretaker government until a new government is formed. Unless, of course, something unexpectedly happens. Um, In terms of new coalitions now after the elections, it's actually quite remarkable that before the elections and also throughout history, Belgium is always a, a, quite a problematic case in terms of coalition formation, especially at this federal level, as I mentioned. You are the world record. Like, sorry, you are the world record, right? Uh, for in, in terms of the period for forming a new government, more than five indeed, indeed. days, maybe. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Uh, it's now actually, after these elections, unexpectedly, it has become rather clear what way the, the parties will probably move. I mean, this doesn't mean that there will be coalitions rather soon, but at least for now, it's it's pretty clear which parties and at which levels will try to form a coalition. And um, well, maybe I'm too optimistic at this moment, but it seems actually quite feasible. Of course, these parties will um, will raise the stakes, especially the ones that are desperately needed and maybe not so uh, obviously connected to the coalitions that I'm about to mention. But we'll see. For now, I think. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be going rather quick. So if we if you look at the at the different levels, and I will divide them between Flanders, Wallonia, and the federal one. So in Flanders, it, it's actually quite funny that um, most parties they uh, refuse to collaborate with the Flanders Wallon, right? The Cordon Sanitaire. And at election night, it seemed to be projected that NVA and Flanders Wallon together would have a majority in the Flemish parliament. And actually, indeed, the, the Flanders Wallon leader Tom van Krieke already called for uh, the NVA leader Bart de Wever on election night. Bart, let's let's work together. We have a majority now. We can make our dream possible about, you know, a more uh, uh, autonomous Flanders. Um, but then in the end, in the actual seat projection, they lost one seat. And together, they don't have a majority anymore, which makes it a bit more easy for the NVA to also exclude Blanc Blanc because all the other parties do not want to collaborate with them. Um, so what you see in Flanders is, there cannot be a coalition with without NVA and Vlaams Belang. That's impossible. So NVA will for sure be part of the coalition. And what seems most likely is that they will form a coalition with uh, the Christian Democrats of uh, CDNV and the Socialists of uh, Voray. Um, this um, yeah, combination uh, would then consist of two parties that remained rather stable, NVA and, uh, and CDNV, and uh, the biggest party, which is NVA, and one that actually won the elections, Voray. Another combination with MVA seems rather unlikely because the Greens, they are ideologically too far. PTB, I already mentioned, uh, PTB, PVNA, I already mentioned, they are uh, a radical left party. It's, it's, it seems impossible that they would uh, form an agreement. And what's left is Open VLD, the Liberals of Alexandre de Croix. But they quite quickly after the election said that they would go into opposition anywhere else so, in, at all levels. So in that sense, it seems rather clear that this is, is the combination that they will try to negotiate for now. And then Wallonia, the MR, the, the, the party that won the elections, together with Les Engagés, uh, which also won the elections, has a very stable majority in the, in the Walloon parliament. And they are also ideologically 
not that distant from each other. Les Engagés is a center, maybe center right party, and MR is more a liberal right wing party. So they announced actually, I think two days after the elections already, that they would go ahead and form a coalition. It's, it, it's not formed yet, but they are negotiating now. So this seems to be also the most likely case. Also, the PS, the, 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 uh, the socialists in Malunia, they announced quite quickly after the elections that they would go into opposition. Um, so that all has also made it maybe a bit easier for them to, to 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 start this combination. But this is quite a change, given that the PS has been in the Walloon government nearly all of the time in the last three decades, and they will now go into oppositions. Um, at the federal level, what we would then see is that actually the, the same parties that are part of the regional coalitions, as I just projected, are also um, expected for now, at least, to also form a federal coalition. Of course, this all still has to take place. But that's at least what it looks like now. So it would consist at the uh, Flemish side of NVA, CDNV, and Vooruit, and at the Walloon side um, of MR and Les Engagés. So these are the same parties in the regional governments that would then take uh, part of uh, a government at the federal level. And this has also been something that, for example, the NVA leader part of the has really been stressing upon, that you should have the same parties in government at the different levels. So I think this is something that he would be really delighted for um, to take place. Um, also, this would consist of Vooruit, which is a socialist party, and it would then become part of the government without the PS, which is its sister socialist party. Um, but it seems not unfeasible uh, that this would take place, especially because Vooruit actually before the campaign, uh, before the elections during the campaign, already said that it would be willing to to enter a federal government even without its sister party PS, which is in a way. Uh, something that would, would accelerate the coalition formation there because uh, the NVA and especially its leader, Bart de Wever, is, is, is not very willing to, to, to govern with the PS uh, at the Walloon side and with, uh, with its leader, Palma, yet. So that, that might actually accelerate the, the coalition formation there. Um, um, yeah, so th those three options, I would say, are now on the table, are negotiated. Um, for now, they are mainly negotiating the regional ones. But there is also uh, a slow movement going on at the federal level. Ah, thank you, Mr. Rack, for sharing your thoughts about the recent uh, Belgian federal election. I have personally uh, learned a lot uh, about Belgian politics, uh, institutions, and and uh, the constitutional background of of how, how actually how this uh, con country function and is governed. So thank you very much for that, and uh, dear listeners, thank you for following our discussion. And please stay tuned for the upcoming Goats and Seeds episodes. Goodbye, everyone.